a lot of talk about Bloober Team's seminal title, The Medium. A lot of the conversation focuses on whether or not this is a good or bad survival horror game. The problem is, this is not a survival horror game. So today we're gonna to talk about what this game actually is and whether or not it's worth your time. I'm Adam Scott, and this is The Medium. Ever since I was little, I've had this dream. The story is undoubtedly the star. The medium is exquisitely paced and plotted with multi-dimensional characters and a complex but not convoluted supernatural mystery to uncover. The story opens with a strong emotional gut punch as Marianne prepares the body of her adoptive father for a burial shortly after his death. Without many words and without overt emotions, you feel the weight of the moment. This is accomplished throughout with both incredible writing and expertly delivered voice acting from Kelly Burke. I guess I didn't know what to expect. When things get personal, it, it just burns you from the inside out. We soon learn that Marianne is able to connect with the other side and is driven to the Niwa Hotel to uncover the origin of her clairvoyant abilities. The story tackles some heavy themes such as domestic abuse and even genocide, but the concepts aren't portrayed in a gratuitous way for mere shock value, and the mood never slips into despair. I had several running theories about what was gonna happen at the haunted Niwa Resort that all made sense, but the true answer ended up being even more elegant and poignant than I guessed. The medium sees Bloober Team leaning into its Polish history, with the game set in post-communist Poland, a thread that runs throughout the heart of the game's narrative. Taking a look at the gameplay, this is where the medium separates itself from the genre of survival horror. In survival horror, you're made to feel vulnerable and underpowered. You often focus on gathering and managing limited resources, and throughout you'll make decisions on the best ways to survive against the threats usually balancing the risk of fight versus flight. The medium, on the other hand, is a psychological horror adventure game. There's very little in the way of balancing the risks associated with survival horror. You're generally searching the environments for clues or objects that open up new areas and progress the story. There are plenty of odd-shaped keys to find, valves to turn, and broken lever handles to repair, which on paper may sound a bit bland. However, Using Marianne's reality-phasing abilities to uncover and obtain these items makes the medium feel distinct, and that kept me engaged in clearing a path through its increasingly ominous obstacles. At specific moments, the signature split screen will reveal itself, which shows a parallel spirit and physical world side by side. Then you'll suddenly be controlling two versions of Marianne at the same time. When both worlds are visible, it's an incredibly striking contrast. On one side of the screen, the flesh and bone Marianne will be moving along dimly lit hotel corridors. On the other, her silver haired spiritual form will be stalking through a hollowed out hallway to hell. On both sides of the divide, the environments are exceptionally well realized. However, the spirit world is particularly eerie to explore and truly feels otherworldly with nightmarish landscapes that feel like we're peering directly into the abyss. Displaying both realities at the same time isn't just done for stylish effect. There's a practical purpose too. During these times, Marianne is able to trigger an out-of-body experience relinquishing control of her earthly self for a short period of time in order to send her spiritual form to areas otherwise unreachable within the mortal realm. In fact, the complementary use of mortal and spiritual abilities is paramount to solving the bulk of the medium's puzzles, which while never stumping me enough to halt the surging story momentum, still required a substantial amount of thought that extended to either side of the split. In a really memorable sequence later on, manipulating the hands of a grandfather clock in the real world will scrub forwards and backwards through time in the spirit realm, revealing clues to a hidden door from the phantom presences that appear along the timeline. While this was really interesting and felt totally unique, I think there was potential to do even more. 
You can just imagine how interacting in one world to affect the other could have been pushed quite a bit further. Perhaps we'll see that in a sequel, or maybe in the upcoming Silent Hill game they're rumored to be developing. Marianne has a suite of powers that work in both worlds. She can sense psychic traces of people on objects. Through these traces, she can either hear conversations or reconstruct ghostly scenes that can lead to clues or aid in puzzle solving. She also has a psychic shield, which is used in the mirror world to either repel evil forces or overcome certain barriers. She has the ability to deliver a blast of energy that can do things like power a broken fuse box or elevator. Marianne can only store so much energy, which is visually represented as a series of fungal looking growths on one arm. The more energy she has, the more rings there are. In addition to the limited energy while in spirit form, Marianne can't stay out of her body for too long or she'll die. Besides Marianne, there's only a few other characters and two are real standouts. One of them, called Sadness, you meet early in the hotel's spirit world. She's a one-armed girl with a porcelain mask for a face, and skin not entirely covering all of her joints. Her look invokes empathy and pity, which is further heightened by the expert voice work by Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. I mean, you seem pretty cheerful to me. Well, it's what I remember. Um, my friends used to call me by a different name. But I don't remember what it was. The other standout is the main antagonist, known simply as the Maw. Where are you? Similarly to Mr. X from Resident Evil 2, the Maw relentlessly pursues you throughout the game. Since there's no combat in the game, you play hide and seek with him, first in the spirit world and then later in the real world. The character adds a much needed dose of action and tension. As you can see, this game looks great and often punches above its weight, making you forget it isn't a AAA release with detailed textures, intricately crafted environments with ray tracing that makes everything pop. The performance was solid at 4K, but only at 30 frames a second. This is a bit disappointing, but a likely trade-off considering the split-screen mechanic. The locations feel real but decayed, once alive but now long dead. The Niwa Resort is the epitome of brutalist architecture from post-communist Poland. Cold and vast, the perfect setting to keep you uneasy. You definitely feel you're not welcome here. The fact that many of the environments have both physical and spiritual versions already creates a lot of variety and visual interest, but as the story progresses, the types of environments also increases. While the character models aren't terrible by any stretch, they're probably the weakest aspect of the overall presentation. Oftentimes the eyes create that uncanny valley doll effect, particularly in close-ups. However, since we're normally pulled back enough, it's generally a minor gripe. The overall character designs, however, are actually really great and quite haunting. The porcelain death masks on many of the characters are really unsettling. Not only do these faceless faces put you on edge, but they have important significance that dates back thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians would bury someone with a death mask to allow their spirit to find their body in the afterlife. Those Marianne interacts with are the bodies of the dead who's been separated from their spirits and are thus stuck in a sort of purgatory. It's a really great design choice. The Maw. Ugh, the Maw may go down as one of video games' most terrifying villains. He's right up there in the same company as Pyramid Head from Silent Hill 2 or Lisa from PT. Music is sparse and uses a low throbbing presence to make you feel isolated and burdened with a heavy load. Sound and environmental cues are excellent and also highlight the mood with disembodied voices moaning or the sounds of mournful wind chimes. The voice acting is amazing and one of this game's big strengths. I've already mentioned the ride delivery by Kelly Burke, where you really connect with Marianne or the sadness conveyed by sadness, but the maw, 
is voiced by none other than Troy Baker, who's no. basically a voice acting legend and really shows his range with this otherworldly and ominous presence. Where is she? Where do you not? Here I come! The medium uses the fixed multiple camera views of the early Resident Evil and Silent Hill games to create tension in a claustrophobic ambience. The downside to this approach is a constant sense of disorientation when you leave one view and progress to the next. You'll find yourself course correcting quite often. The game makes great use of the DualSense feedback. It's amazing how even a little dose of controller feedback can make the game feel so much more immersive. The best uses come when you're using your spirit abilities when you can actually feel creatures hitting your shield or your arm powering up. It's just awesome. Completing this game and getting all the trophies is pretty simple and can be done in a single playthrough. For the most part, you want to make sure that you pick up or examine everything in the environment. There are a number of postcards, echoes, memory shards, and more to collect. Additionally, you'll want to be particularly stealthy around the maw. Most of the other trophies are story related and unmissable. I actually missed two items on my first playthrough, so I had to do part of a second playthrough since there isn't a chapter select. Even with that, it took me under 10 hours to get the platinum. When the phone rang, it was the with each game release, Bloober Team continues to make strides and the medium is another great step forward. The story is genuinely intriguing with interesting and multi-dimensional characters brought to life with brilliant voice acting. The puzzles are an engaging challenge that pull you into the broader supernatural mystery. The Maw is a terrifying addition to the horror antagonist Pantheon, who's actually threatening and fills the game with a heavy sense of dread throughout. The visuals and sounds are polished and suck you in. As long as you don't go in expecting survival horror, I recommend this title to any lovers of psychological or spiritual horror. All right, there's the medium. If you've played it, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And if not, has this changed your mind about what this game actually is? Let's talk about it in the comments down below. Now, if you're looking for great survival horror, you can check out my review of Tormented Souls. If you like this video, go ahead and click that like button. If you're not subscribed, right now is a great time to do so. Appreciate you watching, and I'll catch you next time.